Hi, I'm Shannon Farrell. I'm the Agricultural Law Specialist with OSU's Department of Agricultural Economics. For lots of agricultural operations, ag leases are a huge part of their productive capabilities. So today, we're going to talk about the top 10 things that you should include in any written agricultural lease. Agricultural leasing is a really important tool for lots of operations because from an economic standpoint, it's just difficult to own all the land that you might need to profitably operate your agricultural operation. So leasing is an important and valuable option for lots of us, whether it's for crop production or for livestock production. And in Oklahoma and most other states as well, lots of agricultural leases are conducted on a handshake. As a lawyer, I'm going to suggest that the handshake deal might still be a contract, but it's probably better for you to actually have a written lease in place. And with each written lease, you really need to think carefully about the terms that are going to be made part of that. And part of the discussion of actually having a written lease is that you actually get to discuss through those terms. And the conversation might be every bit as valuable as the written document that you eventually come up with because in the discussions, you actually work through a lot of the problems before they become problems. Having said all that, I would argue that there are probably 10 things that every agricultural lease, whether it's for crop production or for livestock production, needs to contain. So we're going to talk about those 10 things. The first of those is the actual legal identifiers of the parties to the lease. Now that already sounds a little bit like legalese, but what I simply mean is the names of the parties to the lease. That might seem like it's pretty straightforward. It's, you know, Joe and Susan or whoever the case might be. But the question is, how do Joe and Susan respectively own the land or are operating the lease? The land might be owned by an individual. It might be owned by a husband and wife. It might be owned by a partnership, LLC, corporation, trust. The list goes on and on. So you need to make sure that you have the actual accurate legal identifier for the party that owns the land. And you also need to have the actual accurate legal identifier for the party that's leasing the land, which again could be a partnership, an LLC, a corporation. It's important that you actually have those names right because those are the parties that are actually going to be liable for whatever occurs with respect to the lease if the controversy is about the lease itself. So make sure you actually have those identifiers correct. Number two on our leasing list is the actual accurate legal description of the land. We all know that we're leasing the old Ferguson place, but the problem is, well, we might know it's the Ferguson place. Future people that might actually be impacted by this lease might not even know where the Ferguson place is. So first off, let's make sure that we're actually using the proper legal description for the property that's involved in the lease. The northwest quarter of section 15, township two north, range four west, Indian Meridian, located in Logan County, Oklahoma, for example, might be the actual legal description of the 160 acre tract that we're leasing. But let's make sure that that description is actually full and also accurate, which means if there hasn't been a survey of the property in decades, it might be time to conduct a survey of the property. The actual legal description being used in the lease is beneficial for both of the parties too, in that it actually tells the tenant and the landlord the actual physical extent of the property that's being leased. It defines boundaries for what is leased and also defines boundaries for what's not leased. So we often overlook the legal description, but it actually is a really big deal with respect to our lease. Number three is when's our lease going to start and when is our lease going to end? And this issue manifests itself in a number of ways. First and foremost, though, we actually want to know how long does this lease last? And there are two primary ways that we see that happen in agricultural leases. Number one, it might be what we call a tenancy for years or a tenancy for a term. And that lease has a defined start date and end date. This lease commences on January 1st, uh, 2019 and ends on December 31st, 2019. Because the lease has very specific dates for a start and end date and doesn't mention anything about renewals, we know when the lease starts and we know when the lease ends. Nothing additional is needed to give the tenant notice that that lease is going to terminate on December 31st because the lease itself says it's going to term terminate on December 31st. Now another alternative that we see a lot in agriculture is what we would call a periodic lease. This lease commences on January 1st, 2019 and can be renewed annually thereafter subject to the agreement of the landlord and tenant. What that means is that our lease has a one year period, but at the end of that one year period, it can renew and that, by the way, automatically will renew unless the tenant or the landlord provides notice that the lease does not need to renew. Now, an important thing for us to remember 
is that even under an oral lease, and oral leases actually can exist, again, they may not be the best idea, but they can be out there if they're for no longer than a year period at a time. But if they're a one year periodic lease, that means that one year oral lease keeps renewing and keeps renewing and keeps renewing until either the landlord or the tenant says, nope, I'd like to terminate the lease. So how do you go about terminating that periodic lease? Well, in Oklahoma and many other states, if it's a one year period, you have to provide at least three months written notice to terminate that lease. So if our lease was supposed to terminate at the end of December, the 1st of December, the 1st of November, the 1st of October, that's the period by which we would have to have provided written notice that we don't want the lease to renew for the coming year. And I've been using this, this January 1st and December 31st example on purpose because that's the way lots of our agricultural leases work. However, I want you to think of a crop cycle that coincides with the calendar. And the answer is in most Oklahoma cases, you can't think of one. For example, if we're talking about a winter wheat stalker operation, we're probably doing seedbed preparation and cultivation in the summer, probably planting sometime in September. We turn out cattle for grazing, then we may pull them off, probably oftentimes in February, March maybe, and then maybe harvest a wheat crop um, in June. None of those things line up with the calendar year. And so if you're setting up your lease to where you have a renewal notice or you're required to provide notice of termination in the middle of your crop growing, you've got some problems. So I want you to make sure that the period of your lease, if it is a renewing lease or if it's a terminating lease, if it's a, ter it's a tenancy for term or tenancy for years, that it coincides with the production cycle of whatever it is you're raising, whether it's crops or livestock, we don't need that lease either capable of terminating or being required to have a subject of notice of termination if we're in the middle of that production cycle. So think about your terms very carefully and define when you can enter the property, when you can leave the property, and what are the consequences of having a lease terminate when we don't have the ability to pull off livestock or to harvest crops. Think about the what ifs in every situation there. Number four, what production practices are required, which production practices are prohibited, and which production practices are allowed. There are lots of situations in which these terms could arise, but some of the most common might be if you have organic farming going around uh, the property or near the property or on other sections of the property that's being leased. There might be restrictions about your ability to use chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and the like if it might interfere with the organic certification for those other areas. So if you're going to lease land to someone but re preserve organic production around it, one of your terms might be that you don't allow non-organic production practices. In Oklahoma, we have an increasing number of acres going into no-till production systems or low-till production systems, and it takes a lot of time to get those production systems fully integrated. So you probably don't want someone coming in using conventional tillage, and then you have to go back to the no-till system and again resetting the clock and spending years reestablishing that production process. So specify those kinds of things. If we're talking about grazing land, one of the most common issues that I see frequently overlooked in Oklahoma pasture leases is dealing with stocking rates. A well-grazed field can have enormous production possibilities, but a field that's being overgrazed can suffer years of production setbacks. So setting a stocking rate for your field if it's going to be under a lease is hugely important. Now the question is, how do we go about setting that stocking rate? That's something you should talk about with your extension educator, with your animal science specialist, or your production consultant. In some cases, a numeric stocking value, just in terms of head, might be adequate to the task. In other cases, you might be trying to define a certain amount of forage canopy that you want to maintain, a certain height of forage, if you will. Just make sure that your stocking rate is commensurate with what you're trying to preserve in terms of the productivity of your land to make sure that happens. If you have any other kinds of production practices that you want to make sure are used or that you want to make sure are prohibited, again, those things have to be made explicit and leased because if they're not spelled out, the tenant basically has the right under most laws to do kind of what they want in terms of production practices. Number five is who's responsible for things like inputs and maintenance of improvements on the farm. If we're leasing out farmland, one critical issue might be soil health. Well, who's responsible for maintaining the nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, micronutrients of the soil? Is that something that's the responsibility of the tenant or the landlord? And typically, we often think that the tenant should be responsible for ordinary fertilizer operations. But what if we're talking about soil pH? That's something that has a multi-year impact, and it might take us years to get back the economic value of amending soil pH. So if we're going to do that as the tenant, do we need to have a multi-year lease to make sure we reap the benefits of that? 
if we're going to have a fairly short-term lease, is that something that the landlord should actually provide for themselves and include that as potentially a cost benefit of actually having the lease? Other things to be considered, especially if we're talking about a livestock lease, are fences and livestock handling facilities. Now, under Oklahoma law, the owner of livestock is responsible for keeping them contained using ordinary, reasonable, prudent measures. So if we own the livestock, we're responsible if those livestock escape. But what if we don't have the ability to maintain the fence line, if that was something that was reserved to someone else? That's the issue that we run into a lot with agricultural leases, especially with livestock. So make sure there's a clear agreement about who has the obligation to maintain fences and the safety of livestock handling facilities as well. And make sure that the liability issues in the lease are commensurate with that. If we don't have control over the fences, it's hard for us to sometimes take responsibility. But make no mistake, the owner of the livestock is the first person to get on the hook if there's liability for escaped livestock. So again, be very careful about who has responsibility for maintaining livestock containment there. Item number six is rent. We imagine that's probably top of mind for everybody when they're trying to figure that out. And the first question we always get is how do we figure out what a reasonable rent rate is for agricultural land? We always invite people to consult our agricultural land lease surveys that are published by Oklahoma Cooperative Extension as a place to start. But you also need to remember that those rates are regional averages, and so your local market can vary. You're always trying to compare apples to apples as best you can when you're trying to set a market rate for your rent. So take that into account. Get as much information as you can about the local market and about the specific piece of land that you're leasing to actually go about setting your rental rate. There are all sorts of variables, most of them going to the productivity of that land. Obviously, more productive land should be worth more in the rental market than less productive land. So the data that's out there are good sources to start with, but do as thorough a job as you can actually analyzing the market before you actually delve too deeply into those lease negotiations. These days, we see lots of different ways of handling lease rents as well. And Many of them for years fell into the category of cash rents or share rents. And if you're not familiar with those, a cash rent is simply a dollar amount that's paid per period for the privilege of leasing the land. X number of dollars per acre per year would be a cash rent. A share rent, on the other hand, would be based on shares of the inputs into a crop, most likely, and shares of the revenues that are generated from the sale of that crop. When we typically see in Oklahoma is a one-third share, two-third share, with one-third share going to the landlord, two-third share going to the tenant for production of hard red winter wheat. Now, one-thirds, two-thirds didn't just happen by accident. The economics of the production of hard red winter wheat in Oklahoma kind of led us to that one-third, two-third share. But if we're talking about irrigated corn, that's a completely different number. We may be looking at a 60-40 or a 50-50 split in that case. And different numbers exist for soybeans and canola and for forage crops and all sorts of other things. So just because you've always third, heard one-third, two-third, don't just assume that those are magical fractions. That's because the economics of things like seed cost, fertilizer, fertilizer excuse me, who provides mechanical inputs such as you know cultivation, harvesting, labor, all those things that go into the production of the crop, govern how you should probably split the shares for landlord and tenant. So make sure you analyze the economics of those situations first. Furthermore, these days, we've seen lots more creativity in terms of how rents are calculated. We've seen hybrid leases that may have a flat cash term, but have a variable share term or a term that's variable based on market conditions, productivity of the crop, all sorts of other issues out there. We're not going to say there's a right or a wrong way to do it, but we just need you to think through very carefully how you do that. So first, thinking carefully again, take into account the market, take into account the inputs that are provided by the landlord and by the tenant, and then take into account the mechanics of how the rent is going to be paid. When is rent due? Is it going to be paid quarterly, monthly, annually? Is it going to be paid in money? Is that money going to be made in the form of a cashier's check? Is that supposed to be deposited directly to the landlord's account? If we're paying in terms of actual commodity, where's that commodity supposed to be delivered? To a specified elevator? Um, to an elevator under the account of the landlord? The possibilities, as you can see, are endless. So just be as detailed and thorough as possible about when and how that rent is supposed to be paid as well. Item number seven on our list is disclosing other interests that are attached to the land. 
One of the most common things that we see is that this surface owner may not be the mineral owner in Oklahoma. And as a result, without notice, perhaps even to the landlord or to the tenant, we see oil and gas operations occurring on the property. So if the landlord is the surface owner only and doesn't own minerals, that's something that needs to be disclosed to the tenant so they understand that there might be a third party out there with the ability to authorize oil and gas operations on the property. If the surface owner does own the minerals, then you kind of have an obligation to work with the tenant as well to explain that a mineral lease might be in place and oil and gas production might be occurring. One phenomenon that we've seen in the past 10 years in Oklahoma is that surface owners have actually been authorizing oil and gas companies to dispose of salt water, drilling fluids, um, other items from oil field production on property. And for example, drilling fluid may eventually break down, but it takes time to do that. And odds are that your productivity of the land is going to take a hit for some term, maybe a few years. Um, as the soil absorbs or processes the materials contained in that drilling fluid. Lots of tenants have had drilling fluid applied to the property where they were growing a crop, and needless to say, it didn't really act like a fertilizer for the crop. So we had lots of hard feelings between tenants and landlords. So one thing I strongly encourage all tenants and landlords to do is to discuss, for example, the fact that drilling fluids might be applied to the land if that's a possibility, or to explicitly say no drilling fluids won't be applied to the land. But Either way, make sure that any interest regarding oil and gas leasing or development or fluid application are discussed between landlord and tenant and made explicit there. Increasingly in Oklahoma as well, we've seen lots of production of wind energy and in the past two or three years, massive expansion of the solar energy industry as well. So if there's any existing solar leases or wind energy leases on the property, those are things that also need to be disclosed to the tenant because those could cause some changes in how the surface is operated. If we're talking about wind energy development, there might be relatively expansive impacts with respect to the use of the surface, but there's lots of usable surface in between the developed turbines. Um, with solar, it's almost the exact opposite. It's usually a much more compact footprint, but the area of the solar operation is completely occupied by the solar operation. All that to say, wind and solar operate very differently. Again, wind very dispersed, solar very compact but they do have impacts on the use of the surface by a tenant, and that's one thing that needs to be disclosed to the tenant as well. Any other interests out there that might result in a third party interfering with the operation of the tenant on the property, it's just a good idea to talk about with the tenant to make sure that there, are, again, are, are no hard feelings in place there. Item number eight, a partnership statement. When you're leasing land to someone, or when you're leasing land from someone, I'm willing to bet you're not actually trying to form a partnership with them, although you might eventually choose to do that. But Right now, you're not a partnership and you don't want to be treated like a partnership because partners have this thing that we call joint and several liability, which means a liability of one party basically becomes a liability of all the parties. And although it may be a gross oversimplification, especially if there are any lawyers in the crowd, we'll talk about the finer points of joint and several liability some other time, but you just need to know you're not trying to form a partnership with this person. Having said that, especially if you're in a share lease arrangement, you work together on this operation, you provide the cost of inputs in this operation, you share in the revenues from this operation. To an outside observer, it kind of looks like you're a partnership. So you need to make sure that you're very clear about that. Make sure that your lease does, that, sorry, that your lease does contain language that says, hey, we're leasing this land from one another, there's a landlord-tenant relationship, it is not a partnership relationship. Item number nine on our list is notice provisions. How are the landlord and tenant supposed to contact each other if something goes wrong or if they just need to provide some legal notice, like for example, that we need to terminate this lease? Well, you need to specify two notices in your contract. One needs to be an emergency contact. If there's something drastic and urgent that's happening on the property that needs a response immediately, what's the best phone number to contact each party so you can get quick communication going there? And that probably needs to be a mobile phone number and if it is a mobile phone number, make sure that the person that's using it lives in an area where cellular service is somewhat reliable. Otherwise, we probably need to specify a landline number. You should also specify in your lease the emergency contact information for local authorities, for police, fire, and emergency medical response as well, just in case the tenant may not be familiar with the area and needs to know how to reach those first responders quickly. But the other form of notice that we need to provide is the actual legal notice. So again, where do checks need to be sent? 
where do notices of termination of the lease need to be sent, et cetera, et cetera. And that probably needs to be a physical mailing address, although it may be a PO box as well. But if it is a PO box, it needs to be something that will be checked regularly. Um, I've seen it happen time and again with leases that someone specifies a PO box and then the other party says, oh, I never checked the PO box. You should have sent that to my home address. Well, I never checked my home address because I summer in Arizona. You should have sent it to this address. Whatever that address was, you need to specify an address that you actually will check because legal notices do not age well. You need to make sure that you can check that mailbox wherever it is regularly so that you can provide a timely response to whatever notices you receive. The last thing we're going to have on our list, item number 10, is how to deal with dispute resolution. What happens when stuff goes wrong and we just can't agree on it? First off, I'm hoping that by having a robust and lengthy discussion between landlord and tenant as we set the terms of the lease, you've got a better idea of what those problems are and solve them up front before they even become problems. Lots of people think that written leases cause controversy. I don't believe that for a second. I think written leases actually resolve a lot of controversy before it can even raise its head because you've thought through the issues and if you've got a question you can refer back to the lease and say oh this is what we said we were going to do to fix it but let's say none of that works okay do we want to specify that you have to go through a process called alternative dispute resolution or ADR before you can go to court now alternative dispute resolution can take lots of forms we'll talk about two very quickly one of those is mediation mediation is basically a guided conversation facilitated by someone called a mediator helping the parties come to a solution to the problem themselves. In other words, the mediator is not going to impose a solution or say you have to do this to fix the situation. They're going to try to facilitate a joint discussion between the parties and help them arrive at their own conclusion. In the experiences that I've seen with mediation, I think it's the best alternative that we have for maintaining a healthy, ongoing relationship. Um, and sometimes the, the dispute actually isn't anything about the contract. It's a personal conflict, and the mediation has the potential to resolve that. In Oklahoma, the Oklahoma Agricultural Mediation Program is actually run through a grant that we've received from USDA through the Oklahoma Department of Ag, Food, and Forestry. And it's an excellent tool that's available to lots of agricultural producers, so make sure you look into that. Arbitration is another method of alternative dispute resolution, and you can almost think of arbitration as hiring a private judge to have a trial for you. In other words, both parties present their case to the arbitrator with evidence just as they would at a trial, and the arbitrator comes to a conclusion that's provided to the parties and that most of the time the parties are going to be required by the contract to agree. Now, alternative dispute resolution can sometimes be less expensive than litigation, but it looks a lot like litigation. And in my experience, litigation and arbitration sometimes favor the more commercially sophisticated party. So just be careful about agreeing to an arbitration provision unless you're really willing to go to trial on the issue anyway. But we're in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's one big small town. And I think that it's always in our best interest to find the most peaceful resolution to our contract disputes, especially when we're talking about leasing arrangements, because these are the folks that we go to school with, that we go to church with, that we attend community events with, and we just kind of want to maintain those relationships to the best that we can. So very quickly, those have been the 10 items I think every agricultural niece need, lease needs to include. Um, I always encourage folks, again, please, please, please have your lease in writing because stuff can happen. Um, Take, for example, the fact that your landlord passes away. What now? Well, if you don't have a written lease in place, you're kind of in the difficult position of having to prove to the estate judge that, oh, yes, we, we absolutely had a, a handshake contract in place to lease this land. Well, what evidence do you have beyond that? Difficult decision, right? So the written lease is beneficial for proving that we actually had a lease arrangement in the case of the death of one party, in the bankruptcy of a party, because then we have to prove to a bankruptcy court that there was a lease interest there as well. Another way we can take care of that is to record the lease. Yes, leases actually can be recorded in county land records, and it's often in the best interest of both parties to do that, again, to provide notice to other parties out there that the agricultural land was under lease. We've talked about those benefits. We've talked about the benefits of having a discussion of a written lease, but I just hope that this program's given you a little bit of insight into some of the things that need to be included in the lease. What I would just tell you to do is, again, think deeply about the issues, both for landlord and for tenant, and come to an agreement through those through a robust discussion with the parties, 
get that recorded in writing. It'll be great for your farm and for hopefully generations to come. And with that, if you have questions, make sure you contact your local uh, county extension office so that we can get you some resources. Ag Lease 101 is a fantastic website that also connects to aglandlease.info with all sorts of resources, templates, guides for calculating your rental rates. We hope you'll take advantage of those and many more. Thank you guys for being part of our program today.